Hello, my name is James Raffin. If we've ever met on the trail or in a zodiac perhaps, you may know me as JR, but either way I'm pleased to welcome you to a series of presentations drawn from my travels and books, done especially for my friends at Adventure Canada. I should begin by saying though that like many Adventure Canada staffers who spend weeks and sometimes months each year at sea, my super supportive spouse, Gail Simmons, is often asked by those who are convinced she doesn't have an alleged husband. She's often asked by friends and neighbors, where's Jimbo? And her answer to that usually spins an insider's tale or two of close calls and faraway places. But today with COVID-19 in our midst, Jimbo's location is decidedly right here at home on Cranberry Lake in Eastern Ontario. Now, things being what they are in our isolatorium, probably yours too, I'm guessing, you work, you walk, you garden, you social distance, you have close encounters of the COVID kind at the grocery store, <laughs> you have the odd dram, and all that invariably leads to late night online shopping. A while back, I got to thinking about this whole where's Jimbo thing. And, well, a few days later, one of those big smiley Amazon packages arrived in the mail and poof! I've got my <laughs> outfit for the next Adventure Canada Explorer's Night aboard the Ocean Endeavour. Come on along, in the next little while, we're going to go around the world at the Arctic Circle to see about putting a human face on climate change. So this story is called Circling the Midnight Sun, and it's from a book of the same name. Now, by way of introduction, um, I'm a first-generation Canadian, kind of an accidental Canadian. My mom and dad were both from the UK. My dad was in the British Navy, a surgeon lieutenant. My mom was a midwife from northern Scotland. And uh, after the Second World War, they knew they wanted to leave the UK. So my dad had Navy friends in South Africa, Canada, and Australia. For some reason, they ruled out Australia. And the family story is that they flipped a coin, and um, it was heads or whatever it was, and we ended up in Canada. And my sisters and I have often wondered who we might have been had we grown up in South Africa in the Southern Hemisphere versus growing up in Canada in the Northern Hemisphere. But I've spent my life exploring this uh, country of which I'm an accidental citizen. And uh, I want to just say by way of introduction that uh, I was privileged to have, uh, you know, an amazing education starting at Mother Goose Nursery School. Graduated with distinction. I want you to know it's the only time I ever did graduate with distinction. but. Um, there was a parallel learning that was encouraged by my parents, and that was to learn, uh, well, we grew up on a river in southwestern Ontario, the Mighty Speed, and that led to experiences with the Guelph Recreation Commission, with Boy Scouts, and eventually summer camps that sadly gave me somewhat pathological affection for these, for canoes. I mean, I think that's beautiful. Uh, if you've ever wondered what happens when a high-end furniture manufacturer and a high-end canoe manufacturer are side by side on the same street in London, Ontario, and the lads get together for a few brown pops on a Friday night, that's what results. But those early experiences in canoes have led to a lifetime of exploration in this uh, in this nation of rivers, in this river of nations, and. No one was more surprised than me, a uh, completely uninspired English student at John F. Ross Collegiate in Guelph, Ontario, that um, I would spend my life telling stories about what I found in the, uh, on my travels. And uh, they're stories mostly about the relationship between people and place and how people make sense of where we live and how that uh, interaction with nature is uh, is an important part of human endeavor. 
up to and including right now. I have a new book coming out this fall, and this, uh, one, of, one of the talks in this series is actually about Ice Walker, which is coming out in September of 2020. But I want to tell you about uh, one of those journeys that was probably as significant as any other, and perhaps more so. Um, by the uh, first decade of the, of the 2000s, I had spent nearly 30 years doing one thing or another part of every year in the north of Canada. And I had started as a biologist studying polar bear vision and made something of a transition, a pivot they might call it in these COVID times, um, into living and learning with the people who took me to the bears in the first instance and uh, more in the realm of cultural anthropology or cultural geography. but. Um, I really wanted to meet the neighbors, and uh, I thought perhaps the best way to do that would be to circle the world at the Arctic Circle, and that was inspired partly by Sir George Simpson, uh, who was head of the gover uh, governor of the Hudson Bay Company in the 19th century for 40 years, and he'd gone around the world uh, in the most epic journey in 1840-42. But Latterly, uh, Michael Palin, one of the Monty Python troupe, um, had done some amazing journeys, like pole to pole. He went from the North Pole to the South Pole, down the 37th line of longitude, amazing film. He went around the world at the equator. But nevertheless, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to, to, to do that? And that sort of was always running in the back of my mind. And, you know, I thought I knew quite a bit about uh, the world, but... Um, I realized very quickly as I started thinking about this going around the world, um, and this is a story I've often told on the ocean endeavor, um, um, and I hope one day that a longer version of this might be uh, something we would do together uh, in the uh, Polaris lounge aboard the ship, as we're actually on the Arctic Circle somewhere. But um, I realized that uh, many of us are trapped in a view of the world, which is kind of a, you might call it a mercator or a flat version with the equator in the middle. And because those projections that make the world flat that way are, uh, tend to be really distorted at the north and the south ends of that, quite often map makers leave off the top 10 or 20 degrees of latitude on the, and uh, we don't really get to appreciate the adjacencies uh, on the planet until we get a circumpolar projection of the world. And when I looked at that, you know, I didn't know some stuff, but I just want to say there are eight countries around the uh, circumpolar world. Iceland um, touches the Arctic Circle at a little island called Grimsey, which has a million birds and a hundred people. Uh, Greenland, which is working on its way to independence from Denmark, is a huge landmass, the biggest island in the world, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, Canada is there, the United States. And uh, I didn't know, for example, that Norway actually commands all of the Arctic shore of Scandinavia right around to Russia, but that Sweden and Finland both have, uh, both cross the Arctic Circle. But it became apparent to me as I was starting to think about this journey that if you want to understand Arctic affairs, particularly ice, water, uh, the movement of of uh, uh, persistent pollutants, if you want to understand uh, the movement of uh, ideas, animals, uh, you need to understand the, the globe in its totality and that half of that, uh, in a political sense, is commanded by Russia. And so this produced a book called Circling the Midnight Sun, and uh, it's uh, arranged essentially for the reader to take the reader around the world at the Arctic Circle, uh, heading toward the rising sun, roughly one chapter per time zone. But the premise of the book, I mean, the premise of the journey was to meet the neighbors. Uh, the premise of the book itself was relatively simple as well. And it was that many people are looking north and have been uh, as, as an awareness of the relationship between people and the environment, climate change, that kind of thing. But many people are looking north. And for many of us, the image that comes back out of the north is of a polar bear in an unpeopled wilderness, a polar bear often drinking Coca-Cola. And 
uh, a lot of that reportage, a lot of that imagery uh, with bears in this kind of wilderness context. I mean, it was never more famously um, uh, exemplified than in Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, with this semi-contentious 28 seconds of video of a bear swimming around in a warming sea looking for a place to uh, to call home. Um, yeah, we can talk about why that's contentious another time, but my sense, having spent 30 years in the north, was yes, there are polar bears, and yes, there are large expanses with apparently no people in them, but the north is fundamentally a peopled place. And in fact, there are four million people um, living at or above the Arctic Circle, most of them in Russia. 500,000 of them globally are indigenous, uh, speaking about eight different language groups. Um, but it's not a well-known um, fact that the North is a peopled place. Antarctica, by contrast, is an unpeopled uh, wilderness by and large and has been um, since time immemorial. There are scientists in, in there, no polar bears, <laughs> penguins, that sort of thing. But in the North, the people are very much a part of it. And essentially the premise of this book was to to put a human face on climate change. And essentially what I wanted to do was travel around the world and sit in people's kitchens and uh, travel with people and um, learn as I went to find out what was on people's minds. And the original idea was to, uh, the way I sp sold it to my publisher, Harper Collins, was I said, you know, everybody's dealing with change and northerners are, are particularly affected by change, particularly climate change, and uh, they must have strategies, they, the northerners, must have strategies for, for dealing with that, and maybe we could bring some of the wisdom of the north into into this story that comes from traveling around the world. And indeed, um, that happened uh, in the most amazing way. But um, some, yeah, and I want to just tell you a little bit about that in the next uh, half an hour or so. Um, uh, you know, it, and it, I mean, here's here's an example. That guy in the orange slicker is Suave Gilfesen. He's a fisherman in uh, in Iceland in Grimsey, and I I asked him asked him about climate change and what about it and he said well I, I think there are more fish and they're probably bigger um, so climate change for him was a good thing um, beside him is a kind of a silly picture but it's a reminder to me that uh, what you see on the internet when you rent a car or accommodation is not always what you get but throughout the circumpolar world, I ran into some fascinating people, and I want to introduce you to some of them. There's an Annette uh, reindeer herder who's actually racing on the Ob River. But uh, on my list of things that I'd seen in the Arctic, uh, against ballerinas, there was a zero. And uh, sure enough, <laughs> in, in Salahard and Yamal, uh, east of the Urals in Russia, and this is sort of in the early part of Siberia as you're moving across Russia, um, there was this amazing school for the arts right on the Arctic Circle, and here's the uh, first year ballet class uh, doing a little welcome dance for a visitor from across the pole. Uh, not exactly unpeopled wilderness. Uh, in, <laughs> in fact, an amazing school for the arts uh, in the Arctic, in Russia. So, I mean, there are a thousand stories, uh, many of which are included in the book. Um, actually, the, <laughs> the estimate, I thought it would take a year to go around the world. Uh, it, uh, it actually took three, and I thought it would take about a year to write the book, and it took nearly two to do that because of the time it took to sort of sift and sort the, the stories that. But 
uh, through the generosity and kindness of many, many, many people ar uh, around the world, from diplomats all the way through to um, uh, people who are living and hunting uh, on the land itself. Um, I was able to move by just about every conveyance you can imagine from dog sled to uh, skidoo to train to boat to canoe, uh, fishing boat by rented car, by foot, by bicycle, icebreaker and plane trips in between. Uh, that white thing in the middle is a trek all, which is an amphibious all-terrain vehicle that I rode in in Russia. Um, but uh, an absolutely uh, amazing, amazing journey. And rather than, than dwell on any particular time or story, because we'd be here all night, uh, I want to just say that the themes that ran absolutely through the experience was welcome. Northerners are welcoming people. And it didn't matter where I came from or where I landed, people would bring you in and welcome you. They would give you something to eat, they would give you a bed. Um, whether they trust you is a whole other matter, that had to be earned. But in the and some places I had to go back twice, often, sometimes three times, which, um, or more. Um, as we worked our way along building trust to, to get the kind of uh, understandings and stories that needed to be told. But the three things I want to tell you about, um, because they too had a, were themes that went across the experience. I want to tell you about beauty that I found. I want to tell you about resilience in Northern people. And I also want to tell you about determination. But in the beauty category, um, and sort of to cut to the chase of, of the big story from the book. Here's my friend Epoch, Frank Epochowak, and his wife Margaret. And Benoit Keen is a photographer I worked with part way along. Amazing photographer from, from Montreal. Uh, but Epoch uh, and Margaret live in Koloktok, which is a community in western Nunavut on the, uh, on the Coronation Gulf at the mouth of the Coppermine River. And uh, you know, I went and, and most places I stopped, I eventually said, well, what about climate change? And Epoch was, was fantastic. I mean, he, he was so patient and there was beauty in that patience. We went on the land, I've actually known him for quite a long time. Um, uh, and and I, I said, well, what about climate change? And he sort of scoffed. He just said, you know, we've been dealing with change that kind of change all our lives. And yes, there are places where there isn't ice, where there used to be ice, and we have lost people who've come afoul of that, of that situation. Um, climate change is with us all the time. For example, at the mouth of the Tree River, where we often go hunting, um, time was, you know, when, when we were younger and our children were younger, we used to be able to go there and little kids could run freely um, around while we were while we were camped and fishing and, and we could see them. But now that the Lapland rhododendron, the dwarf birch, the dwarf willow, um, the, the shrubbery is much bigger as a result of longer growing season and in warming climate, um, the shrubs are all quite high now so that when the kids run, if there are bears around, it's a, climate change has become a security <laughs> threat for, uh, for little people uh, at our camps. But he said, look, we can deal with that. We've been dealing with that for millennia, since, since time immemorial. We, we have responded as people. The Inuit have responded to that. He said, but the kind of change, so, so climate change is something we're, we're used to, and it's happening more quickly now. We're getting used to that. But um, the change that is of most concern to us is not climate change. It's related, but it's cultural change burying the last syllables of land nuance language in our elders who are taking them with them to the grave, and also burying in many, many cases, too many cases, the promise of the future in our young people who are taking their own lives at unprecedented rates. And, and so in that conversation, Frank, he would find a way to teach, and it was, uh, it, and Margaret as well. And Margaret actually worked at the Northern store. She was in the credit counter there, and 
at one point when Frank was trying to make a point, he said, and both of them, they said, look, put on your coat and come on down here to where Margaret works. We went into the northern store, and um, there it is. And above the, the credit counter were these big, beautiful um, uh, black and white uh, pictures of early days uh, in Koloktuk, which may have been taken by Richard Harrington, I think, but uh, beautiful uh, uh, black and white photos. And Frank points to one and he said, uh, do you see that one? And it's, uh, it's a summer shot. Uh, we were, he was showing me these in the winter, but he said, you've been around here quite a bit. And he said, do you remember an island off the, off the community? And I, I said, well, no. And he said, well, look at this. Do you, here's this, here's the Hudson Bay store. Here's the, the shore. And there's that island. He said, you see those tents on that island? He, he said, uh, I said, yeah, I see those. He said, um, do you, do you remember that island? And I said, well, I, I don't think so. I don't, I've never seen tents off, off the coast of Galactuck. And he said, well, that's because it's, that island is gone. And he said, that's where I was born. He said, but it, we're just used to dealing with that. And um, so that, that, that juxtaposition of climate change uh, versus cultural change, that was throughout. And in fact, it's the cultural change element of this story that uh, uh, added poignancy to uh, to everything that happened. But beauty came in many forms. Uh, here's Ingrid Skuldvar, uh, a Norwegian, young Norwegian woman, very clever, who was involved with Nature Ogungdom, which is nature and youth in Norway. And uh, she got, uh, this was a hiking group originally, sort of, uh, you know, an outdoorsy youth group, but they got very politically active. And in fact, uh, while I was doing the research for the book, Nature and Youth uh, were highly opposed to seismic testing in uh, Vestarelen and uh, uh, Lofoten and uh, actually helped, uh, I think, sway um, a federal election in Norway to a minority parliament situation. Uh, in the name of protecting the, the birth ground of the northern cod, but uh, an amazing young woman. There she is. Um, we actually were there. My wife, Gail, who you see in the green uh, coat, um, we were there traveling together. We happened to be there on June 26th, which is National Canoe Day, so Ingrid, bless her, found us a canoe and we did some canoeing. But here's a kid who was offered a full scholarship at St. Andrews University in Scotland to study environmental issues and she said no thank you and became an officer. It took time to be an officer for Nature and Youth because she believed so strongly in the work that they were doing. An amazing thing. Here's another kind of beauty. I do a lot of northern travel with uh, Students on Ice which is an Ottawa based organization that takes young people from around the world but usually now about half of them are indigenous northerners. And uh, it's amazing, it's an amazing context to, to be in northern places like this uh, haul out at Walrus Island in the north end of Hudson Bay with this w young woman called Daniel Mayock. And uh, I mean, when you're, when you're there at a situation like that, it's amazing, ooh, bad breath. Um, it's amazing to have uh, part of your group looking at something like these walrus as charismatic large mammals as if you were in a zoo and wanting to learn about them and then the other half looking at those animals as as a meal. <laughs> but Students on Ice is interested in building uh, connections between and amongst youth from around the world but also um, giving them skills to go back to their communities to do what they're going to do and we do that in a whole variety of ways. Here's Ian Tamblin singer-songwriter, amazing teacher. He's, he's doing a workshop here, getting the youth to think about their experience and to write songs about it. But toward the end of a two-week expedition each year in the summer, uh, we, we start asking, you know, what are you going to do when you go home to your community? Well, Daniel Mayock, um, she just, she, I remember her sitting quietly talking, I think Mary Simon, and there were other elders, Inuit elders with us and counselors, and uh, she would talk quietly with them, but when, we, when the, the, the other staff would say, well, what are you going to do when you go home? She said, well, I, I don't know, there may be some things I have to do before I can get to this environmental stuff. And she left, and well, I didn't have a clear idea of what she was doing, but lo and behold, that September, in the Globe and Mail is a story about the kids in Kaloktok 
essentially having a protest with signs and everything saying enough is enough. And they wanted to control how alcohol came into Kalaktok, into her home community. And it was the kids who led the charge. And guess who was pretty close to the front of the line was, uh, was Daniel Mayock. And uh, that's a very particular type of courage, a very particular type of beauty. Uh, that has inspired me and continues to inspire me. And I just want to throw in this example. I mean, just as late as last summer, um, at the mouth of the Croker Glacier, which is a Tidewater Glacier on Devon Island, um, beautiful, beautiful place. But uh, we had youth from, I think, 26 different countries. It was amazing. But they wanted to, they wanted to write a script to tell the world a bit about what they were feeling. And so um, a couple of us got together and kind of shepherded a workshop to build a script um, to get these youth out there, northern youth, southern youth. And it was amazing to see them coming together, collaborating, working. And uh, lo and behold, they came up with an amazing uh, uh, script. And we were able to shoot it right away. Uh, at the location where we'd been, and uh, it actually opened. It was one of the pieces that opened uh, the climate talks in New York City in the fall of 2019. And I want to show you that. It's called Two Breaths, because this is a very particular type of beauty that gives me, in the face of climate change, in the face of cultural change, in the face of COVID-19, it gives me hope. For every two breaths you take, one of them comes from the ocean. 50% of the world's oxygen comes from right here. Right here. Right here. Two breaths. One from the ocean. One. Two. The ocean is the base of life on our planet. But our oceans are threatened. They're sick. They're dying. And not just the ocean. Our biodiversity. Our climate. Our nature. Our culture. Our planet. Ourselves. If you're watching this. A person with power and the ability to change the world. Then do better. Do better. Do better. If you're sitting in your house or office, shielded from the effects of climate change, then do better. Then do better. If you've turned a blind eye towards what's happening in this world, then open your eyes and do better. People without voices are fighting to get a voice. So if you already have a voice, then do better. I am the change. I am the change. I am the change. You can be the change. You can be the change. You can be the change. We will all be the change. We will all be the change. We will all be the change. Two breaths, one from the ocean. Well, to see the Northern youth and to see the youth working together from all those different countries was absolutely amazing. And I saw that again and again and again, uh, set against oftentimes stories that weren't so hopeful and weren't so beautiful. But it is there. And in the unpeopled wilderness where there are people, things, there are stories. And in some ways, this book, if it's anything, I hope it's an amplifier for some of the amazing people that are in the Arctic. I mentioned uh, at the top uh, visiting with the Nanette people in the Yamal Peninsula. And I was there in the spring. And um, these are nomadic people still who get together in the spring for uh, bring their, their herds together. Uh, on the ice of the uh, of the Ob River, and they have races, and and but essentially they're still nomadic, and it's it's absolutely amazing. And I had a chance to spend some time with a family of Victor and Ustinia Laptender 
in their chum. There are five of their seven kids. Uh, the other two are, are away at school, but um, nine of them live in that tiny little space and have every convenience you'd ever want, from a cell phone to a computer. Um, and they're still herding reindeer, and somehow the Nanette have prevailed. Um, when the Bolsheviks and the Stalinists said we need to uh, situate the women and children particularly, uh, the men can go off and do the reindeer herding, but you need to be in communities, they said, no, no, we need to stay together, we need to move with our herds, and so they have done that. Amazing story. Uh, their reindeer are stepping over pipelines, they're selling meat to the uh, exploration camps. Um, really totally resilient, adaptable people, but at, toward the end of this visit, um, Victor said, you know, James, um, you've got a family, uh, you've got two children, and that and that, and he said, you know, this is a product that we think, uh, we're, we're, we're very excited about this, and he pulled out this bottle of green soap, and he said, you know, this is concentrated, and it's, uh, it's amazing, it's supposed to have 29 uses, it's, you can wash, pots, you can wash children, you can wash dogs, you can wash, it's not bad for keeping the bugs off, you can, and, and we think we found actually an extra use, a 30th use, it's actually not bad for curing reindeer hides, and I said, wow, uh, that's cool, Victor, uh, why are you telling me that, and he said, well, James, have you ever heard of Amway, and my jaw just dropped, Amway, and he went on to tell me the story of the American company in Chicago that started this pyramidal sales deal and how on earth they got to him. Well, he went to some seminar, some Amway seminar, but it was hilarious. A guy with no fixed address whips out his business card and hands me to a box in, I don't know, Gorno Krasny, some one of the places they stop in their yearly round. And uh, he says to me, look, you know, if, if your family wants some of this stuff, uh, you should put our number on your order because we'll get some benefit. Crazy. Here's a story of, uh, of resilience, of old ways and coming to the fore that uh, as just as we, as we wind up. Um, this is further east in Russia, again, a uh, place uh, called Yakutsk, and that's a Saha church. And uh, I, at the end of a day of talking to Russian bureaucrats about climate policy and that sort of thing, <clears throat> I was uh, the guest of uh, Shlava Shadrin, Professor Vacheslav Shadrin, who's the left in the tie. And uh, at the end of this day, he took me to meet uh, Maxime Duran, who is a shaman. And uh, his grandfather had been a shaman, his mother had been a healer, and his grandfather had actually been given the choice of breaking his drum in front of the uh, Bolsheviks or the people in charge uh, or suffering the consequences which was his uh, execution and that had, had taken place. Uh, Maxime had his grandfather's drum and uh, he is actually uh, a medical doctor, trained medical doctor, but in since the Russia, since the Soviet Union collapsed there has been this re-emergence of indigeneity um, that has allowed to to flourish and uh, Maxime is kind of a, a Saha church healer uh, shaman and um, so I the guy who took this picture was a little interpreter called Ruslan Skribikin and just a, a real character he, he taught English as a second language and he said everything twice he would say James James do you do you and and he would go on like that but anyway I was chatting, Slava was listening, and, and, and Ruslan was interpreting, and I was chatting with, sitting at that little table, chatting with uh, Maxime Duran about being a shaman, and he was talking about levels of the soul, and we were having this sort of really pedantic conversation. This was dry, about being a shaman, a shaman, and, uh, and this was driving Ruslan nuts, absolutely nuts, and finally he said, James, shut up, shut up, and <laughs> said, Maxime, you need to show this guy what you can do. You need to read his aura. And Maxime um, said, well, I got kind of a busy day, I don't think so. And anyway, eventually uh, he said, okay. And he asked me to go and stand at another place in this sanctuary, this church. And he lit a smudge and he went around me and 
the rough translation for shaman or shaman in uh, in Saha tradition is is the man who grabs things from the air. And he was looking through his little loop. There's a hole at the end of that stick hanging around his neck with the burnt part on it. He was looking at me and looking at the smoke and he was grabbing things and sometimes my eyes were to be closed and sometimes they were open. Anyway, we went and sat down at the table. The smudge was still going and uh, Ruslan was just bursting at this point. He, he sat down and he looked at Maxime and he said, So? And Maxime said, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't see anything. He's, uh, he's closed. And I thought, well, you know, the son of a tight-ass British sailor, we don't do emotion particularly well in our family. And uh, so I don't, not a big deal. And Ruslan wouldn't take this, though. He said, come on, you must have seen something. And at that point, Maxime started to draw on the table. And he said, well, I see a line here and some dots and another line there and a curvy line there. And, um, and just as I thought, is he drawing a horse? What's he, which are sacred in this area? Uh, what's he drawing? And just as it sort of crystallized in my head what he'd drawn, he took his sort of bony finger and he said, do you live here? And again, I, I was gobsmacked he had drawn a fairly detailed map of where I am right now. Of Seeley's Bay, Ontario, Alina Lane, that's Tina Anginant's house next door, and Haskins Point, and uh, halfway around the world, completely unbeknownst. I mean, we'd never met before. He didn't have any Google anything under the table. He had drawn a detailed map of, of my neighborhood in, in Canada, which was one of a number of profoundly moving uh, examples of resilience of people with knowledge that, that goes on. But it also made me feel almost embarrassed. I've got a bunch of letters after my name. And man, if those letters, if I ever were to take the idea that those letters give me some kind of corner on the truth, that's just not, just not correct. It's just not correct. And uh, that's part of the wisdom that, uh, that's come from there. Just to finish, I want to talk about determination. And this, this came in many, many different ways. Um, Northern peoples, particularly indigenous peoples, have been put upon by all kinds of different governmental colonial power structures. and. Uh, this is a typical uh, situation where this woman, Valentina Sokaina, who's head of the Sami in the Kola Peninsula, just over the Norwegian border in the, uh, in the Murmansk region of, of Russia. And we're talking with the elders about climate change. And um, I mean, it was interesting that my, my host, Anna Prakova, who's in the dark jacket there, um, with the microphone, she said, "James, uh, you were born in a canoe," and and I looked at her and I, I said, uh, uh, "No, uh, that's just something that's on the web, and I just I never chased it." And my mother disagrees, and she said, "No, you you told me you were, you were born. Tell tell us that story," and I said, "Well, if I was anything in a canoe, it was probably reborn in a canoe because it gave me a kind of a re." purposed sense of how important the lands that I have learned about through canoeing is almost like a rebirth device um, into a re rebirth of consciousness. And she wanted me to tell that story because we'd known each other for a while. She wanted me to tell that story because a lot of the elders in this group were sort of giving up on their indigeneity. They were sort of saying, ah, kids should just forget being Sami. They should just carry on. And it, it was sad and it was inspiring, but somewhere in the middle of all that, there was a determination to be Sami and to assert that. And uh, on the way home in the van, we were in Lovozoro, which is a small community. We were staying in M Murmansk, uh, up near the coast. Um, Valentina leaned to me and she said, you know, I cannot tell you in my heart what I'm really feeling here, James, but I can uh, give you something that will help you understand uh, where I am with respect 
to the kind of questions you're asking. She said, here's a CD by a Sami singer called Mari Boyne, and I want you to listen to a song here called A Conversation with God. And I just want to play a couple of verses of this because it, it was profoundly uh, touching and influential. Church, state, indigenous peoples, north, they've all come together in this, uh, in this experience of traveling. And the image that kept coming back, strangely, was this um, night shot taken from the NASA days of the world at night. And it's interesting how in the north and in the equatorial rainforest, it's dark. And I really got the sense that Northerners are experiencing full on the kind of arrogance of those of us with our enlightened ways, taking our political structures, our ideologies, our laws as light into the darkness of these hinterland places. And if I learned anything circling the midnight sun. It was that it's high time we took that idea and turned it upside down. And instead of thinking about taking light into these dark places, we should absolutely shift that upside down and start thinking instead about letting the light out or finding a way to bask in the light of the people who live there now. And the more I've reflected on that notion of beauty and light it really has taken me to a place uh, that has showed blindness in my own understandings. Um, that, and I just want to finish with that. You know, we're so brilliant and we've created such an amazing world um, of technology and culture and all those things that is somehow uh, more complex and more sophisticated than the cultures at the margin uh, of the world that are still connected to nature, connected to family, connected to community through harvest and traditional ways. But more and more on this journey, I saw this notion that we're going through experience like the cone of light that lights our way down the road. And even when Orion is sitting on the horizon on a beautiful, beautiful night, we're still kind of locked in the light of our own making. And in that, what do we see? We see ourselves. We see constructed knowledge. We see consumption. We see straight lines. We see progress. We see motion. And when we put screens around that, it just becomes this echo chamber, too. I mean, the light, the sound, the ideas are just bouncing around inside. It becomes this self-affirming prophecy that, that we are who we are, and we kind of leave out these great... Um, these other types of wisdom, when in fact in the darkness, outside our little cone of light that we want to take into the darkness, are all these other features, ideas, philosophies, uh, factors, you know, from patterns to sustainability to stillness to indigenous communities. That's all out there, but often we don't see it because we're so busy basking in the light of our own making. and. I really think that if we're going to get anywhere and, and give our, our, our young people 
the kind of leg up that they need. I really do think that we need to find ways to build experiences. And I think Adventure Canada is doing this in a way to take us to the communities at the edge. Uh, because I really think that those um, concepts, those features, those phenomena that live outside our cone of light by and large are the ones that are going to take us forward. And I think we could probably have a whole conversation about COVID-19, where it came from and our response and so on. Because in the end, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pretty sure we are the bear swimming around in a warming soup looking for a place of our own making, looking for a place to call home. And that story is told in Circling the Midnight Sun, um, the last line of which is, we are the bear. Um, that story is picked up in... Uh, in uh, Ice Walker, and I'm going to say more about that in this series. And if you'd like to stay in touch, uh, hope to see you on the on the trail with Adventure Canada. But uh, you can connect with me on uh, on uh, Instagram or Twitter as RafJam or my website at JamesRaffin.ca on Facebook as well. Or you could check in with Adventure Canada. But in the meantime, uh, so long. Thanks for uh, for joining us for this uh, this talk and. Uh, uh, I look forward to catching you again with uh, other elements in this series or on the trail. <laughs>